Good afternoon, and welcome to today's brief discussion concerning the disease Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. What I hope to accomplish is to increase your basic understanding of the disease, how it is diagnosed, treated, and prevented. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, according to the Center for Disease Control, is the most severe tick-borne rickettsial illness in the United States. This disease is caused by the intracellular bacteria Rickettsia rickettsii, a delightfully redundant name. We'll call him Rick from now on. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is considered a seasonal illness, as around 90% of all cases are reported between the months of April and September each year. Contrary to its name, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is most common in North Carolina and Oklahoma, which compose 35% of yearly cases. The entire Rocky Mountain region, however, only contains 3% of cases. Between 800 and 1,200 cases are reported each year in the United States. This figure makes the previous statements even more apparent. You can clearly see the concentration of cases in a thick belt between Oklahoma and North Carolina, with Oklahoma and North Carolina carrying the most concentrated areas. Additional patterns that have shown up over the years is that the most common people to be infected are Caucasian males and children. In fact, two thirds of reported cases of RMSF occur in children ranging from five to nine years old. It's also been shown that people that spend extensive time around dogs are more likely to get the disease at least once, since they carry the most common vector for the disease. So by now you're probably wondering why it's called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever in the first place if it's rare in the Rockies, and for that we're turning our attention to Howard Ricketts. Howard was a pathologist working for the University of Chicago when he became interested in RMSF after hearing about its discovery in 1896. He and a research team not only managed to isolate the responsible organism but also its vector. This was in 1900. Unfortunately, Howard died a mere ten years later in Mexico City after isolating the organism behind typhus, which is another rickettsial illness. He was killed by the organism he isolated. The organism behind RMSF is named in his honor. Now that we know a little bit more about our little friend's history, let's take a look at some of its general attributes. It is an obligate, intracellular, gram-negative bacteria that is non-motile and highly pleomorphic. It is able to take on the form of rods, cocci, and long strand-like threads based on its environment. It relies on eukaryotic cytoplasm for replication, and its home of choice is the endothelium of small to medium-sized blood vessels. In order to infect vertebrate hosts, it uses a vector in the form of a tick. The two most common ticks that act as vectors are the American dog tick and the Rocky Mountain wood tick. The life cycle of our tiny assailant is extremely convoluted, but it mostly looks something like this: infected tick bites vertebrate host, an uninfected tick bites the infected host, the uninfected tick becomes infected. If the tick is male, it infects a female through mating. If the tick is female, it lays eggs containing infected larvae, which hatch into infected ticks, and the cycle starts over again. After entering the body through a tick bite. Our friend Rick sets up shop. As stated earlier, he prefers small to medium-sized blood vessels if he can get them. Once inside a host cell, Rick replicates inside the cytoplasm or inside the nucleus, causing cellular damage. This leads to microscopic damage to the vessels, allowing tiny amounts of blood to escape. This escaping blood leads to the characteristic rash that is common in RMSF victims. This cellular damage can also directly damage organs. As far as signs and symptoms go, there are several. Initial symptoms include fever, nausea, vomiting, muscle pain, lack of appetite, severe headache. Later signs and symptoms include rash, abdominal pain, joint pain, and diarrhea. In other words, you really don't feel well. You're not a happy camper. There are also several ocular signs and symptoms, such as petechial conjunctivitis, anterior uveitis, retinal hemorrhages. Cotton wool spots, retinal vascular engorgement, tortuosity, branch retinal arteriolar occlusion, and optic disc edema. As you can see, these signs are just as numerous as they are varied, and as a result, you will probably not be able to make a diagnosis directly from these ocular findings. 
Diagnosis comes chiefly from symptoms and history, as there is no fast lab test for diagnosing RMSF. Lab tests are usually done for confirmational purposes only. Physicians instead rely on the classic triad of fever, rash, and history of tick bite to determine if the treatment for RMSF is necessary. If the patient gets better, it was probably RMSF. If they want to confirm their diagnosis, they look for thrombocytopenia, hyponatremia, elevated liver enzyme levels, and a positive indirect immunofluorescence assay. The IFA is the reference standard for identifying RMSF. If the disease goes untreated, you're in a heap of trouble. RMSF has a 30% mortality rate if no action is taken, and a 71 hospitalization rate even if action is taken. RMSF can wreak havoc on your internal body systems, causing things such as gangrene, pulmonary hemorrhage, myeloencephalitis, and myocarditis. The good news is that RMSF is very treatable. Almost every case responds against doxycycline, the drug of choice. If doxycycline isn't an option, chloramphenicol is used instead. Of course, the best way to fight against the disease is to not catch it at all. The most effective yet most extreme method is to not go outside between April and September. A slightly more attractive option is simply to wear lightly colored clothing so the ticks show up better. You should also check yourself thoroughly after being outside in an area where you are likely to pick up ticks. The best course of action as far as clothes are concerned is to tuck your pants into your socks to prevent ticks from climbing up your legs. And although that sounds both hot and silly looking, consider this a possible alternative. Anyway, it's also good to spray your shoes and clothing with permethrin, which can last for days if you're out camping. Use spray containing DEET on your skin, but be careful. DEET only lasts for a few hours. Also be careful using DEET on children, as it is known to cause adverse effects in high amounts. Last but not least, if you see a tick on you, get it off as soon as possible. This brings us to a critical point on the proper removal of said tick. To properly remove a tick, you must grasp it as close to the skin as possible with fine-tipped tweezers. You must then pull up with even pressure. Avoid twisting, as this could cause the mouth to break off or the tick to regurgitate, increasing your chances of infection. After removing the tick, disinfect the area and wash your hands thoroughly. The CDC also recommends you place the tick in a plastic bag, date the bag, and then place the bag in your freezer in case you get sick. This would allow for a quicker and more accurate diagnosis of your illness. In conclusion, remember that prevention is a very powerful ally in defending yourself from RMSF. And if you have RMSF, the best course of action is to get it treated as soon as possible. If you would like to learn more about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, I highly recommend the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever section on the Center for Disease Control website. Thank you for listening.